The wolves and bald eagles have had a couple of days of feasting on whale flesh. But before they can devour too much, expert skeleton articulator Mike DeRoos and his team arrive on Calvert Island. They're here to deflesh the beached humpback's carcass, separating thousands of kilograms of muscle and sinew from what they're really after, the whale's bones. The job is as bloody, smelly, and grueling as you'd imagine, but it also reveals a smoking gun clue about what killed this young whale. Next on Whale Bones. The cold waters that crash against the rugged, rocky coast of British Columbia are chock full of life. Nutrient-rich waters from the ocean deep get churned up and rise to the surface here, creating a smorgasbord for some of the smallest creatures in the water, whose numbers balloon, feeding animals higher up the food chain, and on and on up to the biggest that ply these waters, including humpback whales, like the one who washed up on Calvert Island. The whales come back to British Columbia every spring to feast and fatten up after a lean winter spent in warmer waters where they find little to no food. From the necropsy, we know that although the Calvert humpback was a bit on the skinny side after a long winter, he did have food in his belly. He'd made his way back to these rich waters come spring and was busy eating his fill just before he died. Humpbacks are filter feeders. Instead of chomping down on food like toothed whales, they gulp tens of thousands of liters of water, their throat pleats expanding impossibly large, and push the water out between the plates of baleen that hang from the roofs of their mouths. Left behind are dense concentrations of krill and small schooling fish that get devoured. But small prey doesn't mean small meals. Adult humpbacks eat over a ton of food every day, adding on more than nine metric tons of blubber over the summer months. Though humpbacks mostly eat at a table for one, some are known to work together in an incredible coordinated feat called group bubble net feeding. While one whale blows streams of bubbles to form a net, others work together to corral schools of small fish and drive them to the surface where the whales gorge. As a young biologist, Mike saw humpbacks bubble net feeding when he was in Alaska. I've had a lot of field technician uh, work with whale biologists where you get to spend a lot of time following the whales around, watching what they're doing, and seeing how like amazing and cool they are in their natural habitat. So when I was a little bit younger, I had the opportunity to spend a few months up in Alaska every summer, uh, living on a small boat. And we came across this massive group of humpbacks. I think they, we counted like close to 25 whales all together in an area. And this huge big circle of bubbles start to form on the surface. And the water kind of starts to boil with fish like jumping in the middle of this massive bubble net all of a sudden the surface like erupts with animals everywhere and these huge mouths open and it's just you know an incredible sight to see even just with a couple whales but like over 20 whales doing this in one group was incredible so from an early age i always felt really comfortable on the water and connected to the life in the oceans growing up um my father was a big sailor, and so a big part of our life was spending time on our family sailboat, cruising around. I had this great fascination for every like living thing around me, and um, I really loved to find out how things worked too. So, um, you know, if I found a, a dead squirrel on the side of the road, I had this weird thing. I would bring it home and my grandfather was a doctor and we would dissect it together. And so this was sort of my early education. I had no idea that it would lead to a, eventually a career of putting whale skeletons together. 
As Mike and his team strip away and peel back the layers of the humpback's flesh, they discover something hidden deep within. The right side of the whale's skull is fractured in several places, and there's extensive bleeding from the muscles around the base of the whale's skull and neck. We don't know a tremendous amount about what happened to the humpback, but it, it does appear as though there was evidence of some sort of blunt force trauma to the skull. We think that most likely that's got to be involved in maybe a ship strike. Boats are one of the main threats faced by humpbacks today. Globally, humpbacks are cited as the second most commonly struck species of whale and the most reported type here in British Columbia. They often surface unexpectedly in their search for food, and they're known to travel in unpredictable patterns, sometimes resting just below the water's surface. And unlike orcas or other toothed whales, humpbacks don't echolocate, which means they often don't know the location of boats. So mariners need to stay vigilant to reduce the chance of collisions. But ship strikes aren't the only danger these whales are up against. Chronic underwater noise from industrial activity, recreational boating, and global shipping may hinder the whale's ability to communicate with each other, to find mates and prey, to navigate, or for mothers and calves to stay in contact, all of which layer on stress and make surviving harder. Runoff and other chemical pollutants in the ocean travel up the food chain and accumulate in humpbacks' bodies. These toxins can impact the whale's ability to reproduce and fight off disease. Another serious threat humpbacks have to contend with is getting ensnared in nets and lines from fishing and aquaculture. Entanglement doesn't always lead to a whale's death, but it can hamper their ability to move and feed and can also cause dangerous infections. Though some of these whales get reported, Disentangling them is extremely dangerous and needs to be done by professional teams with specialized equipment. And ultimately, disentanglement isn't the solution because it doesn't help all of those whales who swim unseen and encumbered in our vast ocean. During the necropsy, Stephen noticed healed scars on the whale's right flipper close to where it attached to the body signs of an entanglement that the young whale somehow managed to escape. So he survived that encounter with humans, but likely not another. Finishing their job, Mike and his team watch as the humpback's bones get lifted up and off the beach by a helicopter and brought around to the Hakai Institute's dock on the other side of the island. The team leaves the soft remains of the humpback thousands of kilograms of flesh and internal organs to the wolves, birds, and other critters who will fill their bellies for months. At the dock, Mike hangs the bones in nets submerged in the ocean. The first step is to get all the flesh removed and then come back and get them when they're clean. They're a lot nicer to deal with once the, <laughs> once the flesh is gone. Crabs, fish, and millions of microscopic microbes will spend the next six months slowly picking away at the last bits of soft tissue left on the bones. This is just the first step of many that will raise the skeleton high for all to see at the Hakai Institute's main lodge. The hope is that the whale's bones and the story they tell will captivate Calvert's many visitors for years to come create awareness of the threats faced by humpbacks today, and bring the visitors a little bit closer to a part of nature that is otherwise out of our reach. The Calvert humpback is almost ready to travel the ocean once more. Only this time, he's headed for Salt Spring Island, almost 450 kilometers down the coast, where Mike has his workshop. This is the place the humpback will call home for the next two and a half years as Mike readies his bones to fly high above the waves on the next episode of Whale Bones. <laughs>